let's do this um, because it emphasizes the Arvut article emphasizes how um, we should actually be integrated together as a society uh, being a part of integral part of nature so what we have to do here is primarily uh, understand um, that the Arvut article is something that is practical so we have to apply it we have to do it actually between us uh, and once we realize what we have to do with respect to this article um, we'll be able to move forward all right so let's read a little bit and let's see what we can do all right and let's see how it's all going okay um, all right so we're going to move forward now if there is if there are any technical problems let us know um, what I'm going to try to do is uh, I'm going to give the lesson as best I can okay and let's see what will happen from here all right so the Arvut article let's read it first of all let's start reading okay this is a continuation of Matan Torah Arvut means mutual guarantee so where we're all actually responsible for one another all of Israel are responsible for one another now all of Israel means everybody in the group okay so we're not talking about a country we're not talking about a people who belong to a certain country or nation uh, we're talking about the world um, the word Yashar El so anybody that has a dot in the heart and has an inclination to be um, directed towards the attainment of the attributes of the Creator or laws of nature let's say that person is called Israel so when a bunch of those guys get together it doesn't matter where from you could be Chinese you could be African Australian Russian Turkish Arab European it doesn't matter where you're from that inclination is called Israel so when a group of those guys get together they're called the people of Israel so we're not talking about a geographic place we're not talking about a country we're not talking about a group of people who've got a you know national passport or whatever this is a spiritual concept which we taught about um, in the first second you know, third semesters in the beginning so we have to understand that now we're moving forward so I can't keep going back to the same definitions all the time so you got to make sure you're with me on this one all right so let's see what it says all right this is to speak of the Arvut mutual guarantee when all of Israel which is the whole group became responsible for one another because the Torah was not given to them before each and every one from Israel was asked if he agreed to take upon himself the precept of loving others in the full measure expressed in the words love thy friend as thyself so this is what needs to happen in a group of people who study the wisdom of Kabbalah because that group is called Israel and the people of Israel are the members of that group so once again has nothing to do with a country religion or anything like that this is the whole misunderstanding of all these definitions and this is why we have a lot of problems today because the definitions have been misunderstood for centuries it means that each and every one in Israel which is the group would take it upon himself to care and work for each member of the nation which means all of us who study the wisdom of Kabbalah together are called Israel and when we all come to study together we're called the group and we're called the nation right? that group is called the nation and to satisfy all their every needs no less than the measure imprinted in him to care for his own needs so what we have to do is actually make sure that we all have to take care of the spiritual needs of all our friends that's what it's talking about so when a group of people come together to attain spirituality to attain the attributes of the Creator what we really have to do here what we have to understand is that we have to look after each other's spirituality and that is what the important thing is and if we get to do that together we're called the people the nation so we have to so by taking care of each other when he's talking about take care of everybody's needs we're talking about spiritual needs 
So this is very important to understand. When a group of people are studying together, we want to make sure that our friends, everybody in the group thinks about the friends and their advancement in spirituality. <clears throat> and once the whole nation unanimously agreed, so all of us have to unanimously agree, and they said, we shall do and we shall hear, each member of the group became responsible that nothing shall be missing from any other member of the nation. Only then did they become worthy of receiving the Torah and not before. So receiving the Torah, as you know, is attainment of spirituality. So there's no book coming from the skies somewhere. Um, receiving the Torah means coming to a revelation, coming to the revealing uh, revelation of the Creator, let's call it that way. Okay, so the person reveals the upper providence, how everything starts to, um, how everything works in the system of reality. That's what attainment is. Receiving the Torah is actually that, nothing more. And what happens is, as you advance more forward in spirituality, in spiritual degrees, you get to discover everything a lot deeper. Just like a kid is discovering the world more and more as he or she grows up, a person advancing in spirituality is doing the same thing in the realm of spiritual reality he begins to discover more and more um, points where the attributes of the creator are integrated into the system you begin to understand cause and consequence so this is why it's very very important all right <clears throat> so i hope the broadcast is well is the broadcast going well good yeah Okay, so hopefully it's going well. I'm not getting a... <clears throat> All right. With this collective responsibility, each member of the nation was liberated from worrying about the needs of his own body and could keep the mitzvah, love thy friend as thyself in the fullest measure and give all that he had to, to all he had to any needed person since he no longer cared for the existence of his own body. As he knew for certain that he was surrounded by 600,000 loyal lovers who were standing ready to provide for him. So that's also a very important concept here. All right, and what we have to understand is that each and every one becomes responsible for one another. And through that responsibility, what happens is we all get to look after each other. And we all have to agree on that as well because it has to be a collective responsibility. If one portion of us doesn't agree and the other portion does agree, then obviously it's going to be a bit of a problem for all of us. All right. So let's take a look at. So let's see where else we can go. <clears throat> for this reason, they were not ready to receive the Torah at the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but only when they came out of Egypt and became a complete nation. Only then was there a possibility to guarantee everyone's needs without any care and concern. So obviously this has to be done by a group of people who are not related by blood. So this is why it wasn't given to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, simply because they were relatives, they were a family. So what does it mean it wasn't given to them? Were they not in spiritual, spiritual attainment? Obviously they were in spiritual attainment, that's for sure. However though, there is a certain depth, a certain degree of coarseness that when you reach that level, a certain specific force has to apply on the person, which is called the Torah. And this is why where you got that factor, you have people who are not related to you by blood. They're others. So when a group of people come together and they all agree, and they all understand that they want to attain spirituality together, then what they decide to do is they commit to each other. And they have no blood relation at all. They're completely unrelated people. So that force, that um, unity they have between them is much more powerful in terms of attracting force because they have to build love above their differences because they don't have any family ties. Family ties means that I have a natural affection to you. So if I don't have that natural affection to you and you're someone completely different, what happens is the applying effort 
the applying force that we're both putting into the work is much greater. So the amount of coarseness we have between us, the amount of ego working between us is much greater. And that has to be overcome. And that can overcome, that can only be overcome by a special force called the light or Torah. And that's what Torah actually means. Torah means the user manual plus the light. So when you got those two together, you study the wisdom of Kabbalah, you attract the light, and that that light of wisdom, the light of the Creator, that kind of raises us up, just like parents, they work on us and they raise us up. This special energy, this special light works on us as well. However, while they were still mingled with the Egyptians, a portion of their needs was necessarily given to the hands of these savages permeated with self-love. Now, that means when we're still in egoistic nature, when we're still living in egoism, obviously this thing won't work. And that's what being together with the Egyptians means. Okay, And if a desire of mine is still in an egoistic form, that means for that specific desire I'm living in Egypt. <clears throat> so Egypt is is a spiritual concept we're obviously not talking about geography or a country so when all of my desires are in a desire to receive pleasure for myself they're all clothed in egoism self-love then it means i'm living in egypt that's where i am however one thing we should note here though a person who is in Egypt is someone who's studying the wisdom of Kabbalah. So on the one hand, I'm studying spirituality. I want to move forward. I want to advance. I want to get spiritual. And on the way, I'm going through this phase called Egypt, where I begin to discover that no matter how much I'm working, no matter what I'm doing, I just can't seem to go forward. So all the events that happen in Egypt... Um, all those events are actually specifically talking about the things that a person studying the wisdom of Kabbalah is going through. So these are very important to understand because a person really needs to complete that phase, which is actually a degree on its own. And then from that degree, he needs to exit Egypt and then move forward in spirituality. So as long as my desires, this is the, these are the Egyptians in me, all right? So as long as my desires are in egoistic form, there's no way I'm really going to be able to keep this thing called Arvut. I'm just not going to be able to because I'm enslaved to my egoistic nature. And if I can't get out of it, there's no way this Arvut, this mutual responsibility is going to happen. Thus the portion that is given into the hands of foreigners will not be secured for any person from Israel because his friends will not be able to provide those needs as they will not be in possession of them. Consequently, consequently, as long as the individual is troubled with concerns for himself, he is unfit to even begin to keep the precept of love thy friend as thyself. And this is what Egypt means. Egypt means that I'm still entrenched and sunk in the swamp of self-love and while I'm in that state there is no way I can provide any of my friends this mutual guarantee this Arvut however though like I said we're still in Egypt it's a phase where we're working on it and this is very important to understand we are actually working on that state okay it turns out that even after the reception of the Torah, if a handful, well, um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to take it from the, from the paragraph where it says, and you. So I'm on the next paragraph. Okay. So as long as I'm thinking about myself in this paragraph, it mentioned, as long as I, I'm thinking about myself, there's no way I can come to love my friends. It's just not going to happen. So... And if I don't come to love my friends, I'm not going to be able to keep that precept. So that spiritual attainment is not going to open. Love here, sometimes, well, let's also talk about what love really is. When we're talking about love your friend like yourself, or as love thy friend as thyself, well, this is not some kind of a, you know, concept where we're talking about some kindergarten love or whatever. Love is an attribute. So... We're not talking about the kind of worldly, corporeal, Hollywood kind of stuff that you might, you know, 
imagine to yourself when you're saying love of friends or to love someone love is actually an attribute which controls how you behave towards others how you act towards others and that attribute actually includes in itself how the creator would have done any and every action so it involves an attribute plus um, a thought that goes with it so you're actually when you attain such an attribute you're actually moving and acting the same way as the laws of nature would the same way that the creator would be acting it's like a child growing up to be like his mum or like her mum and dad like his mum and dad because we are raised by them so we take their attributes upon us and their attributes are now clothed in us so when we grow up we begin to act and behave according to the attributes we took from our parents now same way when a person's advancing in spirituality what he does or she does is clothe him or herself with the attributes of the creator that's called matan torah receiving of the light or receiving the torah now that i'm clothed with the attributes of love and bestowal now i can bestow but as long as i don't have that clothing i'm never going to be able to keep that precept that action of love and bestowal so when we talk about the attribute of love you've got to be careful and really not not you know sidetrack with all these worldly definitions of what love is because it is so unrelated um, and it is so irrelevant to what we call love in this world that you know, you know sometimes it's it's uh, we just have to actually find another word for this okay so let's read a bit more and you evidently find that the uh, giving of the Torah had to be delayed until they came out of Egypt and became a nation of their own, so that all their needs were provided for by themselves without dependence on others. So here is a step that the people needed to take. So until you come out of Egypt, until you come out of your egoistic nature, there's no way you can get spiritual. So receiving of the Torah requires by default for you to slip out of your egoism. Somehow you've got to leave it behind. Now, receiving the Torah and getting out of your egoism or being above your egoism is stages. So when you immediately leave Egypt, it's not like you get spiritual, but it's like you you know, you change your skin, let's say. So right, it's a phase of that it's a phase that belongs to like a preliminary part that makes it that makes it possible to receive the Torah if, if I managed to explain myself correctly so the process of coming out of Egypt um, reaching reaching Mount Sinai going on top of the Mount Sinai receiving the Torah all of that is a spiritual phase uh, because nothing happens immediately just like that what happens is it's a development of phases just like a kid is growing up just like we have four parts of the day uh, you know four seasons in a year and so on so same here what we have is a phase where the exit from Egypt happens and until they get to the top of the Mount Sinai Moses gets to, to the top of the Mount Sinai and receives the Torah it's a phase all right of where you begin to depart from your egoism and once you departed that eventually and you've risen on top of Mount Sinai which is Sinai it comes from the word hate Sina um, meaning hate in Hebrew so you get on top of all the hate and then you're able to receive the Torah so until you get to that part it's really not you know it's really not spirituality but it's a phase that's starting in other words that part becomes stabilizing uh, and um, stabilizing and making the making the initial step a constant state so it becomes something you don't lose beyond that this qualified them to receive the above arvut which is mutual responsibility and then they were given the Torah 
It turns out that even after the reception of the Torah, if a handful from Israel betrayed and returned to the filth of self-love without consideration of their friends, that same amount of need that is put in the hands of those few would burden Israel with the need to provide for it themselves. So when we're a group of people, even after spirituality, if we have a severe fall, all right, that fall will obviously disable us to keep that law of love thy friend as thyself. Now, in spirituality, our path is ups and downs. So just like there are ups and downs in this world, there are ups and downs in spirituality, and they only make you wiser. Yeah? So you get experience and you become wiser. But when that descent happens, obviously, when you're back in a new level of egoism, it's going to be impossible for you to keep those laws. So the whole group at that point needs to become united. Because what happens is the, move, the, the group moves in waves. So as some people are descending, some people are ascending. Some people are descending, some people are ascending. So like waves in the ocean. So when the whole group is working in the spiritual dynamic, what happens is the ones who are descending are kept afloat by those who are rising. And this is actually what our root turns into once the group connects. So a handful of us, are, although are descending, the ascending part keeps a good grab of them. So it keeps them going on. But what's more, what's really important here is the part that's in that descent must stay on track. If they don't stay on track, then we've got a problem. So that problem must be overcome. And it must be make uh, the group must make sure that the, that everybody is on the same boat and we're all moving together. Okay. This is because this is because those few will not pity them at all. Hence, the fulfillment of the mitzvah of loving one's friend will be prevented from the whole of Israel. Thus these rebels cause those who keep the Torah to remain in their filth of self-love, for they will not be able to engage in the mitzvah, love thy friend as thyself, and complete their love for others without their help. So once again, this is reiterating, underlining with bold italics that the whole group must be united. No matter what state we're going through, the group must feel that we're all interconnected and interrelated. So just like a body, right? So even though I might have a headache and my whole body is feeling that ache, I'm not cutting my head off and getting rid of it because it's giving me a headache. No, what's happening is that the whole body stays together, we keep it together, and all of us maintain that tight connection with the good and the bad. And those good, bad moments are obviously going to happen. And when we go through those moments, we're going to find it difficult to maintain that law of love thy friend as thyself. And that is going to happen. But simply because that needs to happen. And um, because every time we advance in spirituality, our egoism is also increasing. So what we have to do is always, as a group, clothe the egoism with more love. Okay, otherwise we won't be able to move forward. So what happens with increasing egoism is that hatred between people are revealed more and more. Now I have to cover it with the Torah. That's what climbing up Mount Sinai really means. So every time I have a deficiency or I see something negative or I have a bad feeling towards somebody else, I need to somehow cover that with light or with love. And that's how we're constantly building one step on top of the other. And that's how we're going up and up and up and up. There is no other way because when we're growing up as well, what happens is we take a fall, we get up, carry on. We fall, we get up, carry on. It's the same thing. And this is how it must be in a group and also individually as well. Because the individual and the society are one of the same. This is why a group is important, because every time you take a stumble down without the group's support, without someone who's supporting you, helping you, reminding you, 
uh, giving you importance about the goal and uh, and how important the purpose of creation is you'd never be able to stay on the path it's just not possible as a result all of Israel are responsible for one another so everybody in the group so the Israel that is talking about is the group actually and everybody in the group is responsible for one another there is no other way we can make this both on the positive side and on the negative side on the positive side if they keep the arbut until each cares and satisfies the needs of his friend they can fully keep the torah and mitzvot meaning bring contentment to their maker so we all all of us who are studying the wisdom of kabbalah we have to make sure that if we keep this arvot together, this is the only way we're going to succeed. If we don't, we're going to fail. But as we study more and more and more, as we fall, get up, fall again, get up again, fall again, get up again, we'll come to that point of arvot. It's it's you know it's a period where you're working towards it. Obviously. You know, you can't start on day one and get there. It's a, it's a phase, you know. We're going to go through this phase of working to, towards getting our foot. And then the work will come to a certain qualitative and quantitative level where we actually attain that together. So, whether it's a positive or a negative thing, it doesn't matter. We're all bound together. We're all on the same boat together. If the boat sinks, we're all going down. And on the negative side, if a part of the nation does not want to keep the Arvut, but rather chooses to wallow in self-love, they cause the rest of the nation to remain immersed in their filth and lowliness without ever finding a way out of their filth. So obviously, in the group as well, we must have constant routine. We must be in this, you know, in the study mode. We must be on the path. Now, when you fall and rise on the path, it's not a problem. But when you're when you're in the system, and then you become, let's say, um, indifferent, then that is a big problem. Once you start getting indifferent, and you start losing importance, then at that point, you obviously you're not going to make it, and the group will be also suffering from the same thing so maintaining our wood doesn't necessarily mean that we're always you know rising in any case we're rising because you're never going back however though with all the ups and downs as long as you're on the track you can maintain it because like i said one part is going down the other part is going up so um so let's see how that works out Okay. Um, are there any questions at the moment? Burchin? No questions. Okay. All right. So we're on item number 18. We'll see what that's talking about. Like I said, Arvud is a very fundamental article for us. As we go forward, we'll always find uh, every time in our spiritual development when we study the article Arvud, maybe we'll study it again next year or whatever, you'll see that the way you look at the article has changed, the way you um, resonate with it will change all the time. All right then, item number 18. Therefore, the Tana, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yahai, described the Arvut as two people in a boat. When one of them began to drill a hole in the boat, his friend asked, why are you drilling? He replied, what business is it of yours? I'm drilling under me, not under you. So he replied, fool, we'll both drown together. From this we learn that since those rebels wallow in self-love, by their actions they build an iron wall that prevents the observers of the Torah from even beginning to fully keep the Torah and mitzvot in the measure of love thy friend as thyself which is the ladder for reaching adhesion with the, with the Creator. And how right were the words of the proverb that said, Fool, we shall both drown together. So once again, it's underlining the importance that this action has to be mutual. There is no way, there's no way we can actually, um, you know, make this 
if there's no mutuality in the group. Uh, otherwise, it's like trying to live without your kidneys or without your lungs. Now, you can't have a body lacking a vital organ. So, Arvut is basically um, a body with all its organs and it all needs to be working fully functionally. Everybody needs to do their job. So, my liver has to do their job, my lungs have to do it, my kidneys, everybody, all the organs in the body, the heart, the brain, the eyes, ears, whatever, they all have to work properly so that the body is in a balanced state. If they don't, then obviously we're not going to have a balanced state and that's going to be a malfunction. And this is what the state of Arvut is. So when inside the group, we have a group of people who are diverting the group or who are not really flowing with the group or are intentionally begin to you know, push the group out of the path, then we, there's no way we can, we can maintain Arvut. So the group has to by you know by um, default has to make sure that it's rolling on a certain route that we're staying on the tracks so the path might be up and down that's fine but we need to make sure we're staying on track otherwise we're not going to move forward and this allegory here really states um, that there's no other way there's no t there's no two ways around it this point of Arvut must be maintained. It has to be kept. Item number 19. Rabbi Elazar, son of Rashbi, clarifies this concept of Arvut even further. It's not enough for him that all of Israel, which is the group, be responsible for one another, but the whole world is included in that Arvut. Indeed, there is no dispute here, for everyone admits that, to begin with, it is enough to start with one nation for the observance of the Torah, for the beginning of the correction of the world. So a group of people, it's enough for a group of people to start working to get spiritual. Now, to keep the observance of the Torah, it means to keep laws of nature. Now, it's not a book with all kinds of precepts. The word Elohim, which is God, and nature, Teva, they have the same numeric value in Gematria. So nature means the creator as well. So keeping the laws of nature is what's essential here. And if we keep the laws of nature together as a group of people, then it means that we're actually applying the Torah. Torah at the end of the day is light and light and how to how to actually live in the light. That's what the whole study is all about. You can only do that if you keep the laws of nature. Laws of nature are God's laws, okay? Because He created the whole of nature. So the laws of nature are actually the laws of the Creator. There are no other laws except the laws of nature. So humanity actually, if it ever wants to be in balance, it needs to balance itself with laws of nature. And this is what actually the coronavirus is now demanding from humanity because nature is telling us listen we're out of whack you know we're completely out of balance we have no idea how to live properly in a balanced way so if we maintain the laws of nature we'll come to a good balance so that so now we're all locked up at home and all of a sudden you see how wildlife is coming back the whole world is flourishing the air is getting clean why because we're at home we're not destroying the planet anymore. So the world is kind of breathing. So this is exactly what, what it's talking about actually here. So it's not enough just for a small group of people to be advancing in spirituality. But this law, laws of nature, they need to be kept by everyone. Regardless of where you might be living. So we're all interconnected. We're all living under the same blue sky. And if we don't all keep the laws of nature, then we're going to cause harm to ourselves. The planet, at the end of the day, will get by. It always has done. But humans, as part of nature, we also have to understand that we are part of nature and not above nature. And as soon as we realize we're part of nature, we'll begin to harmonize ourselves and balance ourselves with the laws of nature. And this is actually what brings balance 
to the whole of reality. And actually keeping precepts means exactly that. Keeping the laws of nature and balancing yourself out. It was impossible to begin with all the nations at once. As they said that the Creator went with the Torah to every nation and tongue, and they did not want to receive it. In other words, they were immersed in the filth of self-love up to their necks, some with adultery, some with robbery and murder, and so on, until it was impossible to conceive in those days to even ask if they agreed to retire from self-love. So this is actually, we need to understand this in two ways. We can understand it as desires which are inside of us. Because the whole of spirituality is actually inside a person. And because it's inside a person, everything that I'm living, which seems like in this outer reality, is actually a reflection of my inner self. So all the people in the world, the trees, animals, whatever you see on the outside, is a reflection of your self-being, of what you are. So the world is like a mirror to all of us, right? So the way we have to now relate to this is this. When we're studying in a group, there is me and the collective. And then when I'm living in the world also, there's me and the whole of reality as well. So there's me, the group, the whole of reality, and the creator that works behind that reality. So this whole thing is like one big circle with layers in it. So the, the individual and the collective are kind of the same. And this is what it means here. So if we're all going to be in, in perception of reality, if we're all going to be together, connected, then all these desires, all the other people also in the world need to get to this point of arvut. So how are they going to start getting into arvut? Well, they can only start if I get into arvut. All right? So if I get into Arvut with a group of people who are in Arvut, then they begin to impact on the whole world. But what is the whole world really? The whole world is what I perceive, sense and feel in me. So at the end of the day, the whole system becomes a loop. So me working towards the outside <clears throat> and getting feedback from the outside and understanding what my reality is all about. So it turns out that on the outside, there is nobody. But the whole system is working towards me. So in the article, when it's talking about beginning somewhere, we're talking about the beginning point, which is the dot in the heart. Then we start working from the dot in the heart. Then we go into Egypt, start to work with our desire to receive in Egypt. We're studying the wisdom of Kabbalah. And then I understand that I can't, I can't get rid of my egoism, so I want to get out of Egypt. So as I work towards getting out of Egypt, the Creator pulls us out of Egypt. So we leave our egoistic nature behind. When, it, when we leave our egoistic nature behind, it means that at that level I'm leaving it behind. Because egoism will always grow. And then what happens is we go through those phases where we come to the bottom of Mount Sinai. Then we, then Moses, the dot in the heart, goes on top of Mount Sinai, receives the Torah, attains the first level of spirituality or revelation, and now he's got the Torah, which is the manual and how to attract the light. Then he goes down to the rest of the desires, and he starts working on those desires. And those are the time periods where he's spending in the desert. So a person who comes to the wisdom of Kabbalah, and enters that system is actually going through all these phases step by step all the time and this is why we need a group of people right? so we need a group of people to make sure i can apply these things otherwise there's no no chance of me getting any feedback and imagine a reality if we had no people in the world if i was just alone on my on my um, on my own by myself and i didn't have any people around there would be no feedback on the level of human because I'd only be interacting with animals, plants and the still level of creation. Only when we have other people around us in the perception of reality, others around us seemingly, then I have feedback and then I have emotional movements inside of me 
desires, fulfillment, lack of desires, intentions, and so on. So through all these emotional movements, I'm now beginning to live inside an ever-changing reality as I study spirituality. So let's read a little bit more. It was impossible to begin with all the nations at once, as they said that the Creator went with the Torah to every nation and tongue, and they did not want to receive it. So I can't, I can't all of a sudden come to spirituality with all my desires. I can't. It's just phase by phase, just like a kid doesn't, you know, doesn't get to 18 after one year. You know, 18 years, he's 18. 20 years, he's 20. So it's a process. So also inside of us, I can't just all of a sudden bring all my desires to spirituality. It's a phase by phase process. So I'm starting with the with the more purer desires. So the desires that are a bit more purer, they're more inclined to agree with spirituality, with bestowing. So those desires we've got to work with first because they're easier to work with. And th this is why some of our desires don't agree with spirituality and sometimes this is why people also um, stop the study or they leave why because as we, adv as we um, advance what happens is we're starting with these smaller desires the purer ones and then what happens is the the more egoistic desires begin to emerge and you know as they emerge as they surface we begin to feel that they're more heavy and sometimes if you know then obviously sometimes if you don't use the use the environment properly and then what you're going to do is fall and if you don't have the support if you didn't build for yourself that support mechanism you'll fall off now the friends can always pick you up but they can only do that so much because they can't go against your desire they can't force you to study spirituality but they can't force you to go on with them on the path so they're going to help you and support you you know um, for a while but if you're not participating if you don't want to and so on then you fall off the reason a person falls off is because of that elevation of egoism and that egoism is then you know overcoming the person and that we need to be aware of we need to be really careful towards that this is why keeping the spiritual study consistent all the time is very important that every time I'm working with the group, I'm keeping it consistent. I'm not falling off. I'm being with them together in this, you know, in in the, I don't know, in this routine, in this, um, on the path. I'm just flowing with them, right? And that's very important to keep, um, because the minute you begin to fall off, you begin to lose your routine. You begin to lose your framework of study then it's going to become a drama. All right. So let's read a little bit more. Therefore the Creator did not find a nation or tongue qualified to receive the Torah except for the children of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, whose ancestral merit reflected upon them, as our sages said, the patriarchs observed the Torah, the whole Torah, and even before it was given. This means that because of the exaltedness of their souls, they had the ability to attain the ways of the Creator with respect to the spirituality of the Torah, which stems from their dvekut, their adhesion, without first needing the ladder of the practical part of the Torah, which they had no possibility of observing at all, as written in Matan Torah item 16. Undoubtedly, both the physical purity and the mental exaltedness of our holy fathers greatly influenced their sons and their sons' sons and their righteousness reflected upon that generation whose members all assumed that sublime work and each and every one start, stated clearly we shall do and we shall hear because of that we were chosen out of necessity to be a chosen people from among all the nations because only the members of the Israeli nation were admitted into the required arvot and not the nations of the world at all, because they did not participate in it. And this is the plain reality. And how could Rabbi al disagree with it? So, here are two important things we need to take from this. 
First of all, when we're talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we're talking about the three sephirot, chesed, givurah, tiferet. So we're not talking about human beings. We're not talking about people with flesh and bone. Because the whole of reality is functioning on application of forces which are working together to always move towards balance. Everybody, in fact, all of us in nature are forces of nature. Why? Because we all have an impact on reality. So the more um, everybody's in movement and affecting each other, we can actually say that all of us are like vectors, you know, forces in nature, um, creating impact on the whole of reality. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are those three sephirots. Hesed, Givra, Tiferet which is applying its force to the lower generations. And those lower generations, which are us, then become awake, awakened, awoken, with our dots in the heart. And once we're awaken, awakened, actually, um, through the forces of nature, then we start to look for spirituality. This is why when you study the wisdom of Kabbalah, the most important thing is the dot in the heart. If you don't have that, it's a bit of a problem because you can't reconcile the emotion and the search um, together. So the dot in the heart is something that needs to be if a person is studying the wisdom of Kabbalah. It has to awaken, otherwise very difficult to reconcile all these things. So a dot in the heart awakens and that dot in the heart is then obviously inside the system now wants to and needs to participate in the system in a proper way and the proper way of participating is called the Torah that's why it's called the manual and light so we're using this manual to participate in reality properly and as we strive to to participate properly what happens is we track that surrounding light which is wisdom we attract um, the attribute of mercy so we're actually influencing ourselves voluntarily to grow up and just like children become smarter and wiser as they grow up with experience we also do the same in spirituality that is actually what is meant by attracting the light as we study we begin to go through a transformation and that transformation process is called the work of the light However, it's not so, you know, blurry. It's nothing um, that we should be thinking, well, you know, what's, what's this light about? Simply because this is how we grow up in nature as well. We're constantly in, in reality where reality is working on us and raising us. And in spirituality as well, the same thing. When you're in this process, what happens is spirituality, you working together, it raises you spiritually. And this is why it's very important for us to understand that there's no, there's nothing blurry about how a person develops in spirituality because it's really parallel to how one develops um, in corporeality. So what happens is in the system, the, the level where they've got the purer desires begin to awaken first. So after Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the next level of pure, purer desires, the dots in the heart need to awaken as well. So we're always going from purer to coarser. This is why in the 21st century, our world is so egoistic, because we're from the later generations. The previous generations were much purer than us. They weren't so egoistic. They were more balanced with nature. But as the generations advanced, and like us in our 21st century, we're just complete egos. This is why we can't get along with anyone. We don't understand our kids, our spouses, our life. We just like, we can't even get along with ourselves. So all of these things are a chain reaction, a cause and consequence, which actually brings about the birth of this generation, which is also known in the wisdom of Kabbalah as the last generation. And this last generation now has to begin this um, cleansing process. And this is why life is also helping us right now with the coronavirus. It's just weird because just like, um, you know, we're trying to voluntarily purify ourselves, you know, to get rid of our egos and to actually learn to 
overcome our egoism. Life, on the other hand, nature is also pushing us, really pushing us to be um, to be less harmful in reality. So all of us are now stuck in home, just like our mothers would say when we were fighting with our siblings, saying, "Or well, all of you go to your rooms and stay there and think about what you did and wait till I tell you to come out. This is exactly what nature is telling us. It's like mothers screaming at their kids, telling them to go to their rooms, close their doors and, and sit down and think about the wrong things they did. And this is what Mother Nature is telling us to do as well. Shut up, sit down, think about your life and contemplate where you're going to fix this up. What we do in the wisdom of Kabbalah is we do this voluntarily. All right, so we can then obviously when the dot in the heart awakens in a person, we can then say, well, we're the next generation that's coming after Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Uh, and obviously we have to now take on the flag and start moving forward in that process of advancing in spirituality uh, and this is what it means by taking on this sublime work um, and we all have to say together as a group of Kabbalists when we all come together we have to make that mutual agreement together we all have to say we shall do and we shall hear meaning that first we're going to get this done and then we're happy to attain and it doesn't matter what we attain but what's more important for us to do is to actually get it done and to worry about everything that's going to happen afterwards uh, and the reason it needs to be this way is that first we're going to do and then we're going to hear is because this kind of work really gets you out of your egoism because if we were to worry about the reward before we started doing it then we'd really never get out of our egoism this is why in many teachings and religions as well religious um, do their deeds on the basis that they calculate a reward afterwards whether in this world or whether after they die it doesn't matter their actions are always based on the reward that they're going to get and this is why they do things in spirituality we have to start thinking in a different way when we do it all right so this brings us to the end of item 19 i'm not going to start item 20 because it might take more than several minutes. Do we have any questions? We don't. Okay. So we've stopped on number 20. On item 20 will be our next lesson. Was everything okay on the broadcast? Yes? No? Okay. All right. We'll see how, is, how we go. I did a recording here on vMix. Okay. So if you need the recording, let me know as well. Okay, I have done a recording. I will upload it to YouTube. Okay, great. In the meantime, have a great evening. See you guys next week. All the best. Bye-bye.